Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. It is an important medicine taken daily by hundreds of thousands of Americans in their fight to overcome opioid use disorder. But as, but as Dillian Collier reports, they are needing daily dosing and it's causing social distancing problems. Here was the scene this morning outside a methadone treatment clinic on East Quincy Street. Only after a defender's photographer set up his camera did a medical staff member come outside and tell the tightly packed line of people to separate. Dr. Jennifer Sharp Potter, professor of psychiatry and vice dean for research in the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio, provided one solution to help cut down on lines outside of treatment centers while the COVID-19 pandemic continues. And so one of the things that I would suggest is that the city continue to explore looking at ways to give an additional day supply so that people aren't needing to come in as much for daily dosing. Baymark Health Services, owner of the Medmark Clinic that had a long line this morning, says it has expanded its parameters for take-home medication. Methadone and buprenorphine, the other medicine used to treat opioid use disorder, are supposed to be taken on a regular, consistent basis. Being thrown off the schedule, can um, introduce uh, the body to withdrawal and individuals will start to feel uncomfortable and um, that is not consistent with best practice for treatment. One other downside to continuing treatment during a global pandemic, according to Potter. Recovery is not supported by isolation. Recovery is supported uh, by uh, social support. Just how widespread is methadone treatment in the United States? More than 1,200 clinics treating over 350,000 Americans. Dylan Collier, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Dylan. Bear County had another death reported today due to the coronavirus. A man in his 50s with underlying health problems. He makes the sixth confirmed death connected to COVID-19. Health officials say he was being treated for an unrelated health issue at Methodist Northeast Hospital where he died. We understand right now that uh, Mayor Ron Nuremberg is talking as part of his daily news conference. Let's listen in. This officer has also tested positive for COVID-19. The infection, in fact, in this case was travel related, and we do wish him a speedy recovery. We want all of our first responders to know how grateful we are for their service and sacrifice, and that's where we, why we are going to be focused on doing our part in the stay-at-home order. We're still on the front end of this outbreak, and not surprisingly, the numbers continue to go up as more test results come in, and we are dead set focused on getting more tests out into the community. Today, we have 168 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Bear County, up from 157 as of yesterday. The majority of these cases, 89, continue to be either travel-related or close contacts of those folks, such as family members of travel-related cases. 34%. 57 of the 168 cases are the result of community transmission, meaning that we don't know exactly the origin of the, of the transmission. 22 cases remain under investigation, and of the 168 confirmed cases, 42 patients are currently hospitalized. 13 of those in hospital care are in intensive care, and another 11 are on ventilators. Many of you are asking how many ventilators we have in our community. We have approximately 650 available in local hospitals, and we've also made an order with the state for another 2,100 ventilators as of today. We know that seeing these numbers of infected San Antonians grow can be scary, and it will continue to be that way over the next several days and weeks. So beginning tonight, we're also going to report on those who have recovered from COVID-19. So far, of the 168 cases in our community, 44 have now made a complete recovery. That may not seem like a lot off the bat, but remember it takes approximately 14 days for the virus to run its course, and currently there is no antiviral available to treat. I'm happy to share with you that we're also launching a new COVID-19 surveillance dashboard tonight on our website, and you can reach it at sanantonio.gov slash COVID-19. Shows, the dashboard shows the number of cases by age, range, and gender, age range and gender, and by type of transmission. And there's also a map that lets you see the number of cases in each zip code and the rate of infections per 100,000 residents. We're going to continue to build out this dashboard as new data becomes available. So I hope you'll visit it when it launches tonight at 7 p.m. SanAntonio.gov. Now on the Judge Wolf. Thank, thank you, Mayor. We're taking two additional steps to fight this uh, terrible uh, COVID-19 that's infecting our community and, and taking lives. 
Uh, number one, uh, we are in the process of setting up the uh, what we call the alternative care facility or to handle a surge in our hospitals. Uh, currently in uh, Exhibit Hall A out at the Coliseum grounds uh, in our Expo Hall, uh, we're setting up 250 beds. They're in place right this minute as we're talking. Uh, we will have that operation up and going within a couple of more days. It's important that we have that in case we do hit that surge, giving us the capacity to handle additional patients out at the uh, Bear County grounds at the Coliseum. Uh, second, as the mayor mentioned, we're activating a community action collaborative. Uh, <clears throat> Gordon Hartman, who uh, many of you know, and a community leader uh, who's done a tremendous job for San Antonio, has agreed to chair that collaborative and uh, we're appreciative of the fact that he has done that. Now we're gonna tackle three major areas. One of them is gonna be food, shelter, and, <clears throat> and security, which is gonna be one task force. Another one will be business development as we work to recover our economy. And the sec third one will be social services. Now to augment that, to bring resources to that area, will be two key task force. One of them is the federal, state, and government advocacy. I spoke to Congressman Cuellar and Congressman Castro today, and a lot of money has been appropriated by the federal government. But it's a maze of how it comes down to you, and this task force is gonna be critical to sort those funds out and make, we sh make sure we get them to the people that need those funds. The second major funding piece will be the philanthropy committee. That will, that will be up and going, and they will seek to bring private funds to sort of help match some of the local funds as we address the three main issues of social services, business employment, and food security, and shelter. So this is gonna be another layer that we think is gonna really be important uh, to hold our community together and to bring everybody out to kind of help as we go along. Uh, so we're off and running on those. And we are a collaborative. We are combining the powers of the city and the county together to get our city uh, in the best preventative posture for this COVID-19 outbreak and, of course, relief and response efforts. We'll be back again tomorrow with the latest information, and we are relying on you to understand the now, taking another look at what they said, basically a number of 168 cases, 44 have recovered, and he emphasized the importance of that. Mayor Ron Nuremberg said 11 of those are on ventilators. Yeah, 13 in intensive care, 42 hospitalized. One of the things that the mayor said struck me, and he gave mm -hmm. some numbers we haven't heard before. Right. It's the number of ventilators, which are critical once you're mm -hmm. in the hospital to recover if you're hit hard by COVID-19, the city currently has 650 ventilators. They have ordered an additional 2,100, 2,100 from the state of Texas. That would indicate to me they are not comfortable with the amount of ventilators they have right now in the city of San Antonio. He was also very clear about the fact that we are going to see the numbers go up. Mm -hmm. There will be a lot of things going on, but to remain calm, know that they're working on this was mm -hmm. the big issue he's trying to get a, across. And then the, the county judge right. had some news as well. Yeah, he did. There is going to be a community action collaborative, and this is new to us too. It's going to have three separate task forces. The first will be for food, shelter, and security. The second for business development with the economy being hit yep. by all of these businesses being closed. And the third for social services. And one of the big things I heard from that, from Nelson Wolf, was to bring possibly private funds to help fund all of these efforts. Yeah, and that's why I think it's important who the person that he picked to chair or that they that they picked to chair this group is Gordon Hartman, Morgan's Wonderland, a successful businessman in so many different ways. Seems like a perfect choice just at first blush yeah. to head up this committee. Also pointing out the fact that right now on the Freeman Coliseum grounds, they are setting up the capacity for what they called an alternative care facility, mm -hmm. an additional 250 beds if they're needed with the surge that basically everybody is expecting in San Antonio. But he said the latest numbers again are up to 168 confirmed cases in Bear County. And let's talk to our Garrett Berger now. Yeah, uh, closing city parks is another thing that Mayor Ron Nuremberg has said that could be the next step in fighting COVID-19 if people cannot stop congregating in the city's more than 250 parks. Garrett's been taking a closer look, look at what you can and can't do. Garrett, to start, how are they going to enforce this? 
Well, a city spokeswoman said that the Parks and Rec Department has been teaming up with code enforcement, SAPD and the Parks Police. However, with more than 250 parks, as you mentioned, and 70 miles of Greenway trails, she says they really need the public's help to make sure that everybody stays safe. Now, there's nothing specifically in the city's uh, emergency order, the mayor's emergency order, that mentions parks specifically. But it does forbid any sort of gatherings at all, and you're not, and you're supposed to stay at least six feet away from other people when you are out. So while city officials have said you can go out and run, hike, or cycle, those say, those rules would presumably rule out meeting up with someone like a workout buddy or a trainer who you do not live with. But we have not been able to get a straight answer on that from the city regarding that specific question. And we did meet a trainer today who was training a client at McAllister Park. We asked him if he thought he was taking proper precautions. So I've converted a lot of my clients to online training and then the select few that I am, I'm being extremely careful, I'm wiping down, I have hand sanitizer on hand, I'm keeping my space from them. So uh, it's been working so far and I'm pretty quarantined by myself uh, when I'm done training my clients. So I think it's working out pretty good so far. Now, the city has said, though, that playgrounds and fitness equipment are now closed, so you should not be using those. And that comes along with basketball courts, splash pads, and skate plazas. The what is and isn't closed still isn't always obvious to people at the parks. Here at Hartberger Park, things are clearly marked, but not so much at McAllister, where we met that trainer, where we saw one sign and no mention of keeping off of equipment. A spokeswoman for the Parks and Rec Department said signs for amenity closures are starting to go up early this week. Now, while you have seen some signs like that over here at Hardburger, right now we're on the basketball court. They've got a big orange cone here, or big orange uh, barrel saying, don't come out here. Other places have been taking more precautions. Fort Worth, for example, taking away basketball rims to make sure that people aren't congregating for games. That's obviously forbidden here. Whether or not we're gonna see half measures like that or full closures of our park system remains to be seen. Live at Hardburger West, I'm Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Garrett. It was one of the most shocking murders here in decades. A veteran San Antonio Police Department detective shot to death execution style right in front of police headquarters. Paul Venema reports that now because of the coronavirus pandemic, the accused killer's capital murder trial has been postponed indefinitely. As he sat in his patrol car completing paperwork, a man approached Detective Ben Marconi and fired two shots into his head. 35-year-old Otis McCain was arrested within hours and charged with capital murder. Just as jury selection in his trial was to begin, the coronavirus pandemic hit full stride. There's a lot of the jurors in the initial part of that of that jury selection that have self-quarantined. Judge Ron Runhell, who is not only the presiding judge in McCain's trial, he's also the criminal district court's administrative judge. He said that would have created a huge headache if he allowed jury selection to go forward. You have to go and order their individual questioning. And so if there's a juror, for instance, if juror number one is self-quarantined, then we have to wait for that to be resolved before we can bring in jurors two and so forth. Ron Hill ordered that the jury selection process stop completely, citing perhaps the biggest concern, each prospective juror would have to be interviewed in this small conference room. Each side has three attorneys. Um, you have the defendant and the bailiffs that are present, as well as the judge and the court reporter. That exceeds the number of people allowed in one room. Though the trial is on indefinite hold, the original panel of 400 prospective jurors selected here earlier this month remains on standby for when the courthouse returns to business as usual. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. Taking a look outside with live cam, it is dreary. Not that a lot of us are outside, but those of us who have to be, it was drizzly today, Adam. It was, it was a little damp out there and you know, we didn't have a whole lot to show for the dampness, a few hundredths of an inch here and there. The aquifer's still down a little bit today. We're about two and a half feet above average. Here's your pollen count, this is important. Oak, extremely high is what I want to say. It's more than very high. It's at a count of nearly 31,000. Mold, mulberry, and pecan all low. Right now, for the most part, we're in the 70s. 72 Kerrville, 73 Stinson, 70 in Rio Medina. We'll talk about tonight's cold front and promising rain chances ahead. Coming right up. All right, start out this Monday 
cloudy, yeah, gray, drizzly, <laughs> drizzly. But you know, at least the if it's a little bit of rain, I'm thinking only about oak. Get that oak out of here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be good. Get the pollens Oof. out, Adam. Yeah, I showed you that pollen count. Oak at nearly 31,000. Boy, it oh. is up there. Definitely the highest oak uh, pollen count we've seen so far this year. And we should soon be on the downswing, just be over the hump for oak, but we're peaking right now. All right, let's talk about what's going on weather-wise and our overall pattern here, what we have rest ahead of us the rest of this week. Sunshine, it returns tomorrow, and actually, you'll notice lower humidity for a few days. Also, good rain chances by the end of the week. So we could use more moisture, put more of a dent in our drought, boost the aquifer, and I think we will. We've got a good shot at it toward the end of the week and even into the weekend. You look at temperatures right now, they're basically wide ranging all across Texas. 80 Midland, 57 Amarillo, 54 in Dallas. You get down into South Texas and we're mostly in the 70s right now, but we actually have a cold front off to our west that's going to be moving in later on tonight. Don't expect a huge impact on our temperatures from that front, but you will notice some changes in how it feels outside uh, in terms of humidity. We're in the 70s right now. We'll drop down into the upper 50s later on tonight. So behind the cold front tomorrow morning, we start the day at 58 and then we bottom out at 53 by Wednesday morning. So that's going to be our lowest point temperature wise for the foreseeable future. That'll be Wednesday morning. That nice crisp feeling to the air. Those days are numbered this time of year in San Antonio. So enjoy it while we have it. Maybe have your morning coffee outside and do some of your telework, your telecommuting from outside if you want. And then these are just the morning temperatures the rest of the week and into the weekend. Big difference will be the lack of humidity. It's been muggy out there. We feel the mugginess on this Monday. Dew points well into the 60s right near 70. But watch as we go through time. Here comes that drier air from West Texas. It moves in overnight and first thing tomorrow morning, we'll really see a drop in the humidity levels and dew points will be down in the 40s to near 50 during the day tomorrow. I mentioned the rain chances. Our weather pattern takes a shift. We don't even have a prayer at rain Tuesday or Wednesday. Some isolated showers or storms on Thursday, 30%, but then look at Friday. We boost that to a 60% shot. So a little more scattered to almost widespread activity by the end of the work week and even into the weekend. Some scattered showers and a few thunderstorms are likely. So this is a very spring like weather pattern that looks like it's going to take shape toward the end of the week and into the upcoming weekend. And it looks promising for rain chances at least. 58 in the morning, 82 by tomorrow afternoon with the low humidity and a north wind at 10 to 15. It'll be a little breezy at times, but not overly gusty. Wednesday, there's that 53 in the morning, still near 80 in the afternoon. Nothing but sunshine the next couple of days. Thursdays when the clouds are back into place, a few isolated showers and storms, and there's the more likely rainfall Friday into the weekend, especially on Friday. And actually something we're going to keep an eye on for Friday is the potential for some stronger storms. But notice our highs mostly right around 80 degrees with the exception of Saturday, even cooler. That'll be a good reason to be inside. There you go. <laughs> Those strong storms. Yeah, we have enough good reasons right now. Right? <laughs> right, don't we? All right, so he, after a short stint with the Cowboys, he's not leaving the state, Greg Simmons. No, we're talking about Randall Cobb, who's a, a talented slot receiver, not just for the Cowboys, for the Green Bay Packers before that. Now he has a new home in Texas with the Texans. When we come back, we'll hear from Randall about that. And you know what is a big hit during all this lull in sports right now? The virtual NASCAR. Got it for you coming up. I got my toes in the water, in the sand, not a worry in the world, a cold beer in my hand. Life is good today. Life is good today. The Spurs social media page is bringing back some fun members of Patty Mills to keep things light during the stay home work safe orders to battle the coronavirus and big board sports. But first, the biggest news of the day has to be the official rescheduling of the 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. Now, instead of being played this summer, this summer in Japan, the games have been moved to July of next summer, beginning on the 23rd of August and ending on, uh, I should say, 23rd of July and ending on August the 8th. That is almost one year later to the day from their original schedule, which had the opening ceremony scheduled for July 24, closing the ceremony set for August the 9th of this year. But after pressure from a number of countries, Olympic organizers requested and were granted a one-year postponement. Today, the official announcement was made by the president of the Tokyo Organizing Committee, Yoshiro Mori, with the Paralympics set to be staged August 24th to September the 5th. There have been discussions about moving the games in the spring, but there were too many conflicts with European and North American sports leagues. 
Pro Football Government, powered by Davis Law Firm. Former Dallas Cowboy and Green Bay Packer Randall Cobb is now officially a member of the Houston Texans. That's after the veteran slot wide receiver was signed to a three-year, $27 million contract after spending one year in Dallas. The purse strings opened up when the Texans unexpectedly traded DeAndre Hopkins to the Arizona Cardinals for running back David Johnson. That did not include a number one draft pick. So what was it like for Cobb to sign with a team he could not visit due to the COVID-19 restrictions? You know, that's been that's probably been the weirdest part. Um, really, the only thing I've been doing is kind of watching some of the highlights that I could find on the Internet on YouTube and trying to get an idea. I uh, talked to Coach O'Brien and, um, you know, kind of felt uh, the way that they're going to use me and how I can fit into the offense. Um, uh, but, you know, it was it was definitely a little weird. So in his discussion with head coach Bill O'Brien, what does he think he can bring to the Texans this coming season? I, I think over my, the course of my career, I've seen a lot of different things. I've, I've seen uh, how to win. I've, I've seen uh, how to lead. And I think just being able to come in and, and be another voice. I know there's some tremendous leaders on the team, but wanting to come in and be another voice for some of the young guys uh, on the offensive side as well. When asked if he would contribute on special teams, Cobb said he wouldn't mind punt returning. He said he's not much of a fan of kickoff returns as he's gotten older. Now, one of the big hits during the suspension of all major sports leagues worldwide has been E-NASCAR. In their second race of the season, 35 of the big-name drivers were put to the test from their homes on Sunday, running on virtual Texas Motor Speedway track, sitting in their racing simulators. Heck, it was even broadcast on a national network like a real race now that NASCAR's season has been shut down for the time being. Timmy Hill took the checkered flag but one of the front runners and the funny of moments is when Clint Boyer missed his pit after literally running through a competitor, which is possible in virtual racing. Come on, man! <laughs> <laughs> hey, Clint, you missed that sign in that box, buddy. Why well, can't get used to driving through somebody's car to finally can't find a box? <laughs> Boy, I missed that go. up bad. Clint, you've been driving oh. through people's cars your entire career. <laughs> Larry, <laughs> oh, come, come on, boys. The sign wasn't that was, there. That was a low I, blow, Larry. I, yeah, that's a, that's a weird part about it. You actually drive right to the car, and then all of a sudden you're looking for your sign to stop. Oh, it's too late. I'm out of my pit yeah. box. The low blow, Larry. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Greg. Sure. We'll be right back. Stay with us. Fears that the coronavirus quarantine will spark a flurry of unreported child abuse cases has child advocates on alert. Tension inside homes may be growing due to a variety of issues, economic problems, boredom, and close quarters. Ursula Perry reports on how parents can keep their cool and what to do if they don't. Watching the news, homeschooling, quarantine, impending recession with layoffs, add it together and it's a potential powder keg of tension for parents. They have to teach them as if they were in school and they have to keep them entertained and they have to keep them away from other people. The Center for Miracles in San Antonio has not seen an increase in child abuse cases yet, but it worries. It's due to the fact that those who report these cases normally, like teachers, are out of touch. And that puts all of us in charge. Even though we are not going to be with each other as we normally are, we still have a responsibility responsibility to pay attention to what's going on around us. And if something is happening uh, that you're suspicious about, definitely make that phone call. Dr. Kasoon's advice? Making sure that they keep a good schedule for the kids. So a consistent wake up time, consistent bedtime, consistent meal times, set aside time for when you do schoolwork, set, a time, set aside time for where you're going to go play. Try to get outside as much as possible as you can, even if it is just a walk within your neighborhood up and down your driveway. If you find yourself losing control, the best thing you can do for your child is just walk away for like two minutes. If it's a baby, leave them in the crib or the playpen. If it's a toddler, leave them in a room that they can't hurt themselves in or climb on top of something. Just a minute or two. And if that's not enough, then it's time to call this 1-800 number, the hotline that'll help you get through this moment. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. New at six with a lot of big events canceled all over the city and with bars, music venues and art galleries closed indefinitely. Many local artists are struggling. But as Stephanie Cerner reports, Luminaria and the city of San Antonio's Department of Arts and Culture are working together to help these artists with law who have lost the revenue. Hi, 
Jaime Ramirez is a part-time music teacher, a church piano accompanist, a musical theater director, and he also does a lot of side work for local singers and bands. So right now, most of that work is on hold. All the theater work, I had a, a show at the Woodlawn Theater recently that I was music directing, and it's, it got postponed. Luminaria and the city have put together the Corona Arts Relief Program to help each artist with $600 during this time when so many people are out of work. We know that in this time when places like the Tobin and theaters and nightclubs and galleries are all closed, that the artist has lost their performance opportunity. An executive director of Luminaria, Kathy Armstrong, tells us that the arts relief program just started accepting applications last week and already more than 100 people have applied. As for Jaime, he tells us he's okay for right now, so he's spreading the word about the relief program to his fellow musicians. A wonderful singer in town, Azul Barrientos, that I play with. I tell her you apply for this. You know, all her work is music and performance space. They are your dancers, they are your poets, they are your visual artists, your sculptors, your performers, and they are the people who really bring a lot of life and creativity and culture to the city. And so to read these stories of great need, it it is heartbreaking. Stephanie Serna, KSAT 12 News. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center is trying to keep up with the great need for blood during the outbreak with five different blood drives on schedule for this week. The first one today at Holiday Inn Stone Oak. All the blood drives run from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. The next one is tomorrow at the garage at the Pearl. To donate, you need to make an appointment. We have the information on how you can do that along with the locations of the remaining blood drives this week on our website. Just go to KSAT.com. A golden retriever making his neighbor's life a little easier during the outbreak. What he's doing to make sure she can get what she needs while she stays inside. Still a come. And what one local restaurant owner is doing to keep his doors open and employees working. Next at 6. And during this outbreak, people hey everywhere are starting to feel the financial burden. Small businesses and local restaurants are making changes to stay open and keep employees on the payroll. Max Massey sat down with the owner of Bistro 9 on Broadway about how he's pivoting to keep his business going. Adapt to the takeout business, so I'm constantly looking for new containers. Damien Wattel is the owner and chef of Bistro 9. The first time he felt his restaurant take a big hit fell on the night of their one year anniversary. We had 200 people coming over and of course that was canceled. Now with the dine-in option taken off the table, Chef Damien has adjusted the menu, shifted the schedules and changed hours, but still. A complete curve for business all the way down to about 10%. Uh, and now that's probably what we hover with takeout. There are 35 employees on the payroll, but it is getting tougher seemingly by the day. We've made the last payroll with what we had, uh, with the cash we had uh, the last time. There's another one coming this Friday, which might be a little more complicated, even though we operated on a reduced, uh, reduced schedule. And of course, health precautions are a priority. We already have gloves, we already have cleaning products. On top of the standard precaution, Bistro 9 is going above and beyond, utilizing a germ zapper, literally just waving it over the takeout orders. We just use the UV wand over every item that we, that we send and make sure that, you know, you might get it, but you won't get it from us. Chef Damien hoping that this new stimulus package will help out, but still, long-term questions remain. They don't really know, we don't really know, how long this is going to affect. Max Massey, KSAT 12 News. Take a look out at live cam. Still dreary, even more dreary than the last time we saw this, Adam. Yeah, you know, it's just one of those days where some folks have sun, others, well, we're stuck with those low clouds and just a little bit of dampness and a few passing little showers. As for the passing light rain at the airport, one hundredth of an inch. That's the best we can do. We started the day at 60 degrees, 75 was our high temperature in the afternoon. And you look across the state, we had wide ranging high temperatures from near 60 degrees to into the 80s, even Brownsville near 90. A cold front's actually gonna move through tonight. I'll talk about what that means for the next couple of days and we'll look ahead at our promising rain chances coming up. What a wonderful thing, just a sweet thing. So we started doing 
the schlepping <laughs> back and forth. And it's been fun. It's been a, a real treat. She got the list. She gave it to Sunny. Sunny brought it to me. I went to the store, got her her groceries, and he delivered them all to her. If people that are especially vulnerable to the coronavirus relying on others to get their essentials, that might mean ordering a delivery. It can also mean getting help from a neighbor or a neighbor's dog. Sonny, a seven-year-old golden retriever, turned delivery dog in Colorado. He's been making trips back and forth from his house to his neighbors since the coronavirus outbreak started weeks ago. That neighbor has some underlying health issues. She says getting food and visits from Sonny makes those days a little more bearable. Sonny also gets the mail, picks up trash around the neighborhood when he's out on walks. What it a looks good like dog. Sonny's enjoying it too, I yeah, think. I think so. It's amazing. Well, even when there is a stay at home order, we're all supposed to be social distancing. There are still some things that can build a buzz, like the Tiger King on Netflix. Steven yeah. and I were just talking about this. You've probably seen the memes and friends talking about it on social media. It's not just your social circle. It is the number one show on the streaming service. Yeah, I finished it this weekend, yeah. I'll admit. Now, if you don't know Tiger King, it's a true crime docuseries exploring the world of big cat owners. The show by filmmaker Rick Kirkman focuses on Joe Exotic, proprietor of an Oklahoma roadside zoo, who is a self-described mulleted, gun-toting polygamist and country western singer. That's Netflix's description of the show as well. By the way, Rotten Tomatoes giving it a 97% critics rating, a 96% audience score, and according to Netflix's own daily rankings, Tiger King is the top most watched title in the United States. Adam's going, what? I know. So maybe you'll have Adam to watch it. Adam doesn't get the whole thing. <laughs> we'll see. We'll make him watch it. This is bizarre. <laughs> the organizations behind the Emmys and Golden Globes are changing their rules due to the coronavirus outbreak. A lot of TV productions are on hold, as I'm sure you've heard. So the Television Academy is extending its Emmys eligibility date for hanging episodes. It's also revising the voting calendar and suspending some events. Yeah, the Hollywood Foreign Press Association relaxing the screening requirements for the Golden Globes. Screening rooms and theaters are closed in Los Angeles, so the association says applicants can submit links or DVD copies of films. Everything's changing. Yeah. And if you thought you missed your chance to get to the to get some Samoas and Thin Mints this year, good news for everyone from the Girl Scouts. The organization is selling those beloved cookies online. The group, like all of us, are adapting to a world of social distancing. Yeah, the cookies will be delivered to your door. The proceeds will help your local troop. And if you want to help out the Scouts, but don't really want to let those cookies loose in your house, you can always send them to someone else. Just opt for donating your cookies when you order online. So many people are excited about this. Yeah, I'm oh. one of them. <laughs> you know, a lot of people in the newsroom can't get enough. They were that's, stashing their boxes. That's true. Adam Kasky joins us now. And all right, he tried to watch I did. Tiger King. Yep. And you are not a fan of the show. It's interesting. It's fascinating, right? Like, just kind of what is going on yeah. here? A whole yeah. nother world. But uh, it's not addictive like other shows can be, to me at least. Yeah, okay. It's unique. I'll give it that. All right. All right. So we have good rain chances later this week, and obviously we could use more rainfall across South Texas. And I want to compare drought monitors. The previous one, which was through the middle part of last week, notice the big red swath indicating the extreme drought to the current one when we've definitely chipped away at the extreme drought across South Texas with the good rainfall that we had late last week and uh, basically contributing contributing to slightly better conditions. I like this trend and I think we're going to continue this trend later this week and into the weekend, but we really need the rainfall farther southwest of San Antonio in particular, even in Gonzales and central Gonzales County. We've had a few light showers out there this afternoon and right now not much to it uh, closer to basically between Gonzales closer to San Marcos. We've got the areas of light to moderate rain streaming northward. They're just brief splash and dash little light showers. I don't anticipate a whole lot more the rest of this evening and actually we're starting to clear out farther to the west of town. I know Valverde's looking at some late day sunshine right now and especially in West Texas some good sunshine. That's because of this cold front moving eastward. This is our cold front that's going to be hitting us later on tonight and early tomorrow morning. Notice that way out ahead of it and 
in the warm sector here, and well, I should say out ahead of the warm sector, that's where we have some good rainfall, good, good overrunning there out ahead of the warm front. I wish we could take that good soaking rain and push it our way, but we're going to have to wait a few days for our good rain chances to really settle in. First thing you'll notice tomorrow is a change in humidity. Dew points right now well into the 60s, even nearing 70 degrees, especially in and around San Antonio. So we're really feeling the mugginess, but that's going to change with this little cold front that moves through later on tonight. And notice how first thing tomorrow morning with that northwesterly wind, our air dries out. So we're looking at a big drop in the humidity. It's going to be crisp. It's going to be comfortable the next couple of mornings and take advantage of the next couple of days. You now you can get outside, take a walk, exercise outdoors. It's going to be nice because rain chances then ramp up toward the end of the week. Right now, temperatures, well, anywhere from 82 in Beeville to 86 in Dryden to 70 in Rock Springs and Fredericksburg and 74 here in San Antonio. And I think through the evening, we'll see our temperatures just gradually falling off and then basically into the mid 60s by midnight, settling in the upper 50s by tomorrow morning. A few lingering sprinkles out there through 8 o'clock and then a clearing sky later on tonight, especially behind the cold front. So we'll wake up to a lot of sunshine, lower humidity, and overall, a pleasant day tomorrow. A north wind at times a little breezy, 10 to 15, maybe gusting to 20. But from 58 in the morning to 82 for the afternoon high. Wednesday morning, down to 53 degrees. So a little, a little more of that crisp kind of fall feel to the air, even though it's springtime. Then we'll make it to 80 for the high temperature with a lot of sunshine. By Thursday, that's when we start to see the rain chances creep back into the picture. Just a few isolated showers or brief thunderstorms. And then by Friday, we're thinking it's more likely we could see uh, more scattered activity, maybe even more widespread showers and storms and even the chance for a few stronger storms. It's within the realm of possibility on Thursday and notice those rain chances stay in the 40, basically in the scattered category, about 40% through the weekend. And we're not looking at a big warm up anytime soon. We had some 90s last week. We're keeping them in last week, not bringing them over. All right, when I see five days in a row of rain chances, I get worried about flooding. Are you worried about that at all? No, not at this time. Nope. Okay, not right now. You can continue your, your yard work, Steve. Weed and feed, Steve. Weed and feed. <laughs> He's really into the weeding right now. We discussed it earlier. <laughs> in case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. Over the weekend, city and county leaders decided to release more information about the current cases in Bear County. They've listed the number of cases by zip code, and we are actually tracking those cases for you. This is the homepage of KSAT.com. As you go up, you can read the latest information, but we also have some interesting maps here that I wanted to show you. These are the maps as it, this is the map, if we take it full, broken down by zip codes. You can see the zip codes with the most affected right here, 78209, 9 to 12 cases. That is the red zip code here. Then you can see some of the other zip codes that have been affected. What was expected to be a busy election season is now having to hit pause in light of the harsh reality of COVID-19. It's why the May 2nd municipal and school board elections now will be part of the November 3rd general election. And by the time we get to November, that ballot should be extremely long because we're taking all of these entities from May and putting it onto that November ballot. New York remaining the epicenter of the U.S. coronavirus outbreak, but federal Federal officials are warning that every state and city in the country needs to prepare to handle the level of crisis that New York faces now. What you see us going through here, you will see happening all across this country. The San Antonio Food Bank is getting ready for its first mega site donation tomorrow. And this morning, HEB helped to stock the shelves. Just last week, HEB donated more than $1 million worth of food for Feeding Texas to meet the needs of the food banks across the state. The San Antonio Food Bank says the donations could not have come at a better time because over the last few weeks they have been worried about meeting the needs of local families. A lot of you at home have been asking us what you can do to help the community. A lot of you are helping your neighbors out, but we want to remind you the number one thing that needs to be done right now is giving blood. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center is trying to keep up with an intense need for blood during this outbreak. There are five blood drives on schedule for this week. The first one is today at Holiday Inn Stone Oak. 
all these blood drives that we're mentioning are from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. The next one tomorrow is at the garage at the Pearl. And to donate, you need to make an appointment, but there are slots available. We have information on how you can do that, along with the locations of the remaining blood drives this week. It's all on our website, ksat.com. And we want to remind you that at those blood drives, they are definitely adhering to social distancing and cleanliness, so that should not be an issue. Yeah, as a matter of fact, they take your temperature when you first walk in the door. Yeah. It's the very first thing they do. All right, we're looking at some rain later this week, Adam. Yeah, we are, Steve. It's looking more likely as we get into Friday. Right now, that seems to be our day where I think we've got the best chance. We're giving it about a 60% shot right now, so some scattered activity, maybe even some uh, stronger storms, and through the weekend as well, some scattered showers. So take advantage of the beautiful sunny days while we have them, tomorrow being one of them. Low humidity, 58 in the morning, 82 by the afternoon. Very similar on Wednesday, but 53 Wednesday morning, then sunny and 80 later in the day. Ooh, low humidity, I'll take it. Yeah, that does it, that does it for the news at 60 on the night beat and online at 9.